I was reading an article where he, he basically said, yeah, uh, the Polish economy has grown considerably in the last decade. Um, and we attribute a lot of that to the influx of uh, Ukrainian migrant workers, um, especially during Maidan, because what happened? The West came in, austerity was imposed on Ukraine, uh, all the public health care shut down, all the public universities shut down, um, and the jobs shriveled up. Hello everyone, I'm Rania Kalik and this is Dispatches. When most people in the West think of the war in Ukraine, they think of February 24, 2022, when Russia launched its invasion. But for eight years prior, there had been a war raging in the country that received little attention because its reality was inconvenient for Western narratives. In the Donbass region, home to the breakaway Donetsk and Luhansk People's Republics, an estimated 15,000 people had died in this war between 2014 and 2022. The Donbass is home to mostly Russian speakers who'd been under attack by the Ukrainian military following what many described as a U.S. and NATO-backed coup in 2014 that gave rise to an anti-Russian government and helped empower ultra-nationalist sentiments that have their roots in Ukraine's Nazi collaborators of World War II. To discuss the war endured by the people of the Donbass, I'm joined by Fergie Chambers, a journalist and general secretary of the Berkshire Communists, who recently published a piece in Globetrotter about his time in the Donbass, titled A Donbass Diary, Looking Back at Early Stages of the Conflict in Ukraine. But before we jump into it, be sure to hit the subscribe button and the bell so you get a notification whenever we post new content. And if you appreciate this show, you can help it grow by becoming a patron at patreon.com slash breakthrough news or by donating below on YouTube. Fergie, welcome to the show. Nice to be here. Nice so to <laughs> nice to see you as well. So there's a lot I want to talk to you about. Obviously, we're going to start off talking about the Donbass because you wrote this excellent piece in Globetrotter, which I will link to in the description. But, you know, I think a lot of people have maybe heard the word Donbass, but they're not quite sure like what people are talking about. So can you just like set up a kind of brief background of like what happened in the Donbass after 2014, after the whole Euromaidan? like U.S. backed coup that took place in Ukraine. Uh, and then we can go from there. Yeah. So if we just briefly go way, 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 way back, uh, the Donbass is this eastern portion of Ukraine, you know, roughly 30 to 40 percent of the land area. Um, it was not very settled for hundreds of years, actually. Um, there, there were some early Serbian settlements there. Uh, and, I'm showing a and, map right here for those who are only listening. Yeah. You should yep. go watch the video. But uh, yeah, just showing a map here so people can see what area you're talking about. But please continue. Right, yeah. So the Donbass technically then, of course, is Donetsk and Lugansk. Uh, Luhansk is more of a Ukrainian pronunciation than Russian. But during the Soviet era, it, it was much, much more settled and developed, this area, because um, there were really, really rich mine deposits everywhere. And it became kind of the mining core. Uh, there's kind of this Paul Bunyan-esque figure in Soviet lore, Stakhanov. Uh, who was, I, I think, in a, a town called Rubizhne that I visited the, on the front line, actually. But this, so this created this, like, very strong Soviet workers culture in this region. Um, and it's been, you know, always since then and very ethnically Russian. So 2014, you know, fast forward, um, and we have this, of course, U.S. installed coup. Uh, and in the wake of that, we start seeing all these anti-Russian language initiatives, laws. Um, we also, of course, in, on May 2nd in 2014, there is a massacre at the trade union building in Odessa. Um, I had the opportunity to meet a few comrades who were there um, or who had comrades who passed, who were killed in that. They said, so nationalists, Ukrainian nationalists, came and set fire uh, to the trade union building in Odessa. And, and that was a real turning point because uh, I think it made clear to people that this anti-Russian sentiment was really going to be weaponized um, and it also made it clear that this anti-communist and anti-socialist sentiment um uh even just anti-union uh which goes along with the privatization accords uh that the west imposed on ukraine uh with the eu association agreement um so all of this like anti-labor anti-socialism anti-russianness all of these things were packaged together um and so i think I don't know the exact number, 40 some people were killed in that massacre in Odessa. <clears throat> and immediately 
people in the east, um, especially in Donetsk and Lugansk, the two major cities in those regions on that map, um, start saying, uh, look, we're not going along with this government. This is not our government. Um, mm -hmm. We didn't vote for, you know, if you look at the election that preceded the U.S. coup, uh, over 50 percent of Ukrainians voted for the pro-Russian candidate. Um, and if you looked at the map, uh, you know, when you look at a U.S. electoral map, you see blue dots surrounded by seas of red and some blue strips up the coast. You look at Ukraine, um, you would see that the eastern half of the country voted pro-Russian and the western half of the country voted pro-West. Mm -hmm. um, so these people in the east who consider themselves Russian, whether that's an ethnic, cultural, uh, linguistic thing, you know, a, a lot of the people from the Soviet era who sort of consider themselves culturally Russian, it's not even about, you know, genetics or eugenics, right? Like I think of a place like Gagauzia, uh, which is a Southern uh, sort of Russian separatist region uh, in Moldova. And they consider themselves very much Turkic. It's Bessarabia, but culturally they've been connected with Russia for many generations and they respect that and, and sort of appreciate the, this multinational uh, coexistence that came under the USSR. Um, so I, I think for different people in the Donbass, what being Russian means might mean something else, uh, you know, to each person, but very much this Russian identity was strong there. And in uh, the Zaporozhye, which uh, you can see that on the map there too, this, this region um, where we have Melitopol uh, and uh, some pretty significant industrial happenings. There's a, there's a major plant there, a nuclear power plant there. Mm. Um, it's also seen a lot of fighting. Uh, so yeah, so this is like the background to the Donbass. The separatist movement breaks out and immediately the Ukrainian armed forces come in to put it down forcefully. Um, and the front line of, of the Ukrainian armed forces in that effort are uh, these rogue battalions, initially rogue battalions that were explicitly Nazi battalions. Mm -hmm. um, we have Pravi Sector, which is right sector. We had Tornado, uh, Aidar, and then, of course, Azov, right? Um, and there, there, are, there are more. Um, but these unofficial battalions, uh, as this fighting begins, what, it really what was a civil war and is a civil war, um, they were eventually officially adopted into the Ukrainian armed forces. Um, so they went from being these, again, explicitly Nazi uh, roving bands, as it were, to, to being the front line of the Ukrainian, uh, the, the, the Kiev, the, the efforts of the Kiev regime in that region. Um, and this war went on pretty much ceaselessly. Um, we have, I think, estimates of anywhere from the number I see most often is 15,000 dead, um, right. uh, 15,000 civilian dead um, in the eight years between 2014 and 2022 when the special operation begins. Um, and overwhelmingly, that's coming on, on the side of the civilians in Donbass. And, and when you're there, you can you can see why. Um, yeah. And I mean, OK, so the population of the Donbass as a whole is something like four million people, which is quite a lot. I mean, that's just just to give people an idea. Obviously, like Ukraine is a very large country. Uh, but I mean, when you think about like like Lebanon, I live in Lebanon, the population in Lebanon is like six million people. So there's like yeah. countries smaller than that. So it's quite a big area. Um, and of course, like you mentioned, people are reacting. Well, the to population this. has shrunk since 2014. I, I imagine so. But yeah, yeah. Have, have fled, many people fled to Russia. Uh, mostly right. from Donbass, yeah. Right. And that's where you get this, of course, like separatist sentiment is once you have the rise of this, you know, uh, government in Kiev that's pro-US, pro-NATO, but more importantly, it takes on this very anti-Russia sort of ultra-nationalist uh, sentiment that spreads across the country and empowers these essentially like right-wing or Nazi style militias that you mentioned or battalions that have now been folded into the Ukrainian military. And it's really incredible because, you know, this war has been ongoing for so long in which you would always hear, there were some reports here and there, like you can go back and look at reports from like the BBC in some cases from CNN where they visited at some point during those eight years that you mentioned. So there's Even little bits vice. and pieces and vice exactly. But once the war starts in February 24 of last year, where Russia invades Ukraine, this suddenly becomes an issue of, oh, like any talk about what was happening in the Donbass now is Kremlin propaganda, is Russian propaganda. It's almost like there was never a war there. There's no suffering there. And so what's really important about the piece you wrote is you actually visited these places. 
you spent several months, I think you spent like three months uh, traveling around different parts of the Donbass, speaking to people that really never have a voice in Western media. So I'm curious if you can give us an idea of the conditions that you saw on the ground. I just want to quote you real quick. One thing that you said that stuck out to me uh, was that there's no active plumbing in the city. Uh, I think you were in Donetsk at this point. Uh, you can correct me if I'm wrong. There's no active plumbing in the city for about 20 to 22 hours each day and no hot water at all. Ukrainian armed forces had blown out the water supply. So just to give people an idea, but talk to me about the conditions on the ground uh, in the areas you visited. So it really depends where you were. Um, you know, Donetsk, that was a major situation there. Um, I, thankfully, uh, in Lugansk, for instance, um, you know, the northern region, uh, the main city, which is also called Lugansk, mm -hmm. uh, is now much more set back from the front lines. So life is operating relatively normally there. Of course, there are like economic restrictions. Uh, but in, in any of the places that, that are not immediately on the front, things have improved considerably in the last year um, because the, the influx of Russian humanitarian aid has been enormous, um, uh, as well as just the stability of having the Russian army come in. Um, and, and this is another thing that people sort of miss in this equation, right? I mean, I think it's very similar to Syria. Like, you can think whatever you want about, like, the Russian government or Putin or this or that, which is an, an entirely different conversation. Um, I've written a little bit about that, too. But uh, whatever you want to think about that, like, these people, uh, to defend their own territory and their own homes, really asked the Russians to come in. And when the Russians came in, things got better for them. Um, so... You know, I think about like the difference between Mariupol and Melitopol. Um, Mariupol, of course, famously, you know, was the site of some of the heaviest fighting that this war has seen. <clears throat> um, and, you know, the what it looked like nine months ago, you know, was like, I, I imagine what Aleppo looked like. You know, I, I mean, just another world. Um, and, and the, you know, the accounts that we got of how that happened and you know, who did that and why were very different than, you know, what we saw about, you know, Russians mindlessly bombing children in theaters or whatever they wanted to tell us in the West. Um, Melitopol, the Ukrainian army, I, for one, whatever reason, tactically decided they were going to abandon. Um, and so when the Russian, when the Russian army came in, uh, the city all of a sudden just kind of changed hands. And when I was there, it was very peaceful. And it was, you know, I, I wrote about the first Victory Day parade that had occurred there in seven years because the Ukrainian authorities made it illegal to commemorate the victory over the Nazis in the Second World War. Uh, so they had not been allowed to celebrate that, which is maybe the most significant holiday. Well, yeah, they, they had some law about you can't celebrate Soviet, like you can't celebrate the fact that the Soviet Union defeated the right. Nazis. It's just right. so crazy. Right. They even, when I was there, and I, I didn't get to write about this, but uh, they had uncovered... Um, I think it was about a dozen uh, bodies of Red Army soldiers uh, that were like mowed down in this field. Um, and I think they recovered them five, six years ago. And, and the, the Ukrainian authorities would not allow them to have a proper burial and a ceremony. So we actually had the chance to see um, it was a number of Red Army veterans and they did a whole proper burial um, with the caskets. They built a monument. They had an Orthodox priest come out and, and they did a whole ceremony the day before Victory Day. Um, that was pretty cool um uh to see that this stuff come back so again like the, the situation in melitopol which was not right on the front line and didn't see fighting was like markedly better than in mariupol um but then i talked to you know for instance i have a good friend who is a portuguese reporter um who's still there uh and he just took pictures of mariupol and it honestly it looks incredible um I, I, moscow has sent millions and millions of dollars. Um, and once they were able to clear out the Azovstal bunker, um, where I, I think the, you know, even the Western media was kind of following, you know, Azov's last stand. Um, once that was done, the port of Mariupol opened up again. Um, and so they've really been bringing all these supplies in and, and rebuilding the city rapidly. Donetsk, uh, the way the front line is positioned, uh, it, it kind of uh, works its way into the region of Donetsk so that when you are in the especially western and northern districts of the city of Donetsk, um, like the Kirovsky and Petrovsky districts, uh, you're sometimes two, three kilometers from a Ukrainian artillery position. Mm. Um, and so there uh, it can be hell. You know, um, for instance, I, I think 
maybe you've spoken with Russell Bentley before. Um, he, he's an American who joined the DPR forces. And I was visiting his house a little bit, which is right there by the front line. You know, and there's just shells going off everywhere. And you drive down a street and every fence is littered with bullet holes. Um, and a lot of people have left, but mostly the, the more elderly, the more impoverished the people, uh, uh, the more they remain and the, and, and the more action they're seeing. And then, yeah, the, the water supply was taken out in a lot of these frontline places, but Donetsk is the biggest city in the region. So uh, it's pretty notable that, you know, you're at, you're at like a sushi restaurant, um, you know, and having drinks and you go into the bathroom and you can't wash your hands. You know, uh, there's hand sanitizer everywhere. You can't flush a toilet. Um, yeah, water even, is even running water is important. Plumbing is yes. important. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't even know, you know, I got there uh, in the middle of the night and was like, oh, I'm going to take a shower. No, you're not. No, you're not. <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> and this is, you know, it, it's notable, too, because um, something that, that the Ukrainians did early on, also in 2014, of course, Crimea voted to join Russia. Um, you know, in the West, they say Putin annexed Crimea, um, but they uh, put a blockade on the water supply to Crimea. Right. Um, you know, and this is reflective of Israeli tactics uh, in Palestine, of course. You know, it's one of the sort of dirty tricks of uh, Western imperialism is, you know, we're going to poke you in the water. Mm -hmm. um, Same uh, in which, Syria. Same in Syria. And, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting you bring up Syria because as I was reading your piece, you're interviewing all these different people um, who are saying things like, I want to quote one woman that you spoke to. She said, they attack us simply because we did not want to follow a government that betrayed our heritage. We in the Donbass did not support Euromaidan. We are Ukrainian, but we are Russian. What would you have to say? What would you have? And then you asked, what would you have to say to anyone reading or watching this in the West? And she responds, I want to repeat to America and to Europe. You send weapons to Ukraine, Ukraine kills. I'm not sure who they consider us to be now, but we are Ukrainian. We all have Ukrainian passports. You aggravate and escalate the situation even more. You should sit at the negotiating table, not try to solve this by sending more arms. Um, and then, of course, there were other sentiments that had this like sort of narrative that would be blasphemy in the West. But it's this narrative of like the government in Kiev are the bad guys uh, and they're actually like the occupiers. And then Moscow is seen as like the liberator. And of, car of course, you know, obviously what's happening in Ukraine is not the same as Syria. But at the same time, you know, it just reminded me of talking to people like you mentioned Aleppo uh after the syrian government took it back from these like you know collection of jihadist groups that the us and the gulf states were backing and the sentiment actually was that of course the government's coming to liberate us from these crazy people who've been shelling us but also there was like an anger at the government for not doing enough and not doing it harder and i right. saw that you you had quoted some people there too who were like upset the russians hadn't come in sooner right well everybody i mean that was years. the thing because because I, I really did look i I, I lived in Russia before. Um, I'm, I'm very much an anti-imperialist. Um, so, uh, of course, I went over there with a little bit, with, with some suppositions, right? right. I, I don't claim to be unbiased. Um, but I had an open mind, as it were. You know, well, what do they think Putin's been too aggressive here? Do they think this wasn't the right move? No. To, 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 you know, to the extent that there was any hesitation about Putin it, it, across the board, it was always like, yeah, I really don't know what he was doing. I don't know why he took so long. We all knew damn well, you know, they said the Minsk agreements, of course, which were <clears throat> supposed ceasefires um, brokered in Belarus uh, between Russia and Ukraine, Russia sort of on behalf of, of the separatist republics. Um, you know, they were broken every single day. You can look at, um, you can look at the, I forget the name of the NGO, that, that was monitoring these cameras for the ceasefire. Um, I, I'm spacing right now. I have it somewhere. But uh, every single day that ceasefire was broken, and it was always broken by the Ukrainians first. Mm -hmm. um, so, so that was big. The other Syria thing, um, you know, just mentioning Mariupol or some or like Rubizhnya, uh, some of these frontline towns, uh, something I heard in every single one of these places was that once the, either the Russian or separatist armies uh, would come into, would get within range of a city that was Ukrainian occupied. Uh, the Ukrainian armed forces would embed themselves in residential buildings, um, specifically on the on the roof, and then in floors in between. And then they would make civilians stay uh, often in the basement or in the floors in between uh, the artillery positions, um, so that. Uh, a, they couldn't leave. Um, 
but B, so that it would kind of create these civilian casualties and kind of force the Russian hands. Um, because in a lot of cases, uh, and this is, I, I think, accounts for some of the slow pace of the assault in the East, um, the Russian army is not interested in creating civilian casualties or, or even in kind of breaking too much stuff along the way, because they understand that uh, that these are people that, that would kind of be allied with them. Mm. Uh, and that, you know, if, if these regions become a part of Russia, as they're now recognized to be, um, these are going to be Russian citizens. So that they weren't really interested in going there and just blowing everyone to hell. Um, and there is a little bit of a PR game at play there, too. Of so course. in a lot of cases, um, what, what I witnessed and, and what people expressed, sometimes even with frustration, um, was the amount of restraint that was being shown by the Russian armed forces because they didn't want to just go in and blow these buildings to hell that they knew had people in them. Um, right. And everyone I know who was on the ground in Syria, um, including like uh, Ava Bartlett was with me for some of these uh, for some of these caravans that we took with journalists, and that's just somebody who had been there a decent amount, um, you know, described, wow, this is, tactically, this is identical. And, you know, what's the overlap? What's the common theme there is who's backing these people? Who's training these people, right? The United States. Uh, and, and what have they done, even if it's a completely different situation? Well, they've created a proxy war. They've completely destabilized, you know, an entire region. And so regardless of who wins or loses, you know, in some ways, it, it seems like this is this is the primary focus that, that the U.S. has. Let's destabilize yeah. the hell out of a place, you know, and uh, con a few disenfranchised lumpen into doing our bidding for us. <laughs> um, but. You know, um, and, and, and that's that's the game. Well, and, and by the way, we can reestablish sort of full vassal control over Western Europe while we're at it. You know? Right. No, and I mean, of course, in the in the long run, all of this this does. And I mean, the the common thread here, like you said, is like the proxy war aspect, the destabilization aspect. And you know what happens in these kinds of situations? It is it empowers the worst people imaginable. Like when you destabilize and like create vacuums in various places, like it's not a surprise that the most ideologically like hardened people rise to the top. It's like neighborhood gangs and like mafias. Um, yeah. And so it's actually not surprising in Ukraine, the more Ukraine is destabilized, the more you're going to have the rise of these sort of like fascistic militias because they're the most ideologically committed right. to, to, to fighting uh, and to gaining. And in Syria, too, like you had these live rise of these like fascistic, you know, militias, these jihadi militias. In some cases, it was just like the same people who were criminals in the neighborhood before just like saw opportunities to, you know, milk people as much as possible, make them pay like protection money, like do all of the kinds of things that like you do when there's no, I hate to sound like a right winger here, but like basically the US goes and gets rid of law and order, right? <laughs> they take away the law and order of a place when you take away the government structures because you destabilize it. Uh, and then, yeah, it makes it much more easier to go in later and like use everybody to your advantage and have puppets and pay people off. Yep. Um, but, you know, all of that said, I thought it was interesting. You you mentioned this earlier. I'm curious if you can elaborate a bit uh, about the issue of humanitarian aid to the Donbass coming in. Um, you said that, you know, once Russia started its military operation in Ukraine last year, like it actually made the situation better for the Donbass. And then you had all this Russian aid coming in, which makes sense because obviously it borders Russia. It's easy to get things in and out uh, through that border. But I'm also curious how sanctions play out here because obviously the Donbass is, tech I mean, even though they voted to be a part of Russia, you know, last year, um, it's still technically considered Ukrainian, but then there's all these By sanctions- the by the West, but then there's all these sanctions on Russia. I'm curious how that plays out in a place like the Donbass. Can you spend money there normally? Like maybe you could in Kiev, um, or is it like under a different system it's of economic- totally strange. It's so okay. strange. I mean, <laughs> once once the civil war began <clears throat> in 14, um, they really started sort of going by the ruble primarily. I mean, you'll 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 have Grivna, you'll, you'll have Ukrainian currency like here and there, especially when you get to like more recently liberated places like in Melitopol. I was at a market and it was kind of like, who knows who's taking what? Um, the craziest thing I remember about like the kind of different jurisdiction stuff is so when you get into Donbass, uh, if you have a Russian SIM card now, maybe it works a year ago. That wasn't going to work. Um, certainly an American SIM card was not going to work. So you had to go to this like Phoenix Wireless, it was called. And it was the only thing that would operate in in that in Donetsk. Lugansk was something else. Uh, 
but th- but it, this was the strange thing. So we get um, everybody's got this Phoenix wireless, and we get in a caravan to to go to Melitopol through Mariupol. We're actually driving through no man's land for a little bit. This was a crazy drive. I have these Russian soldiers that are listening to nothing but Metallica and American country music um, <laughs> on the way through, <laughs> just like the middle of nowhere with AKs on the dash. Um, but once we cross into what was you know just recently Ukrainian territory. All of a sudden, everybody's Donbass Phoenix wireless goes out. Nobody's got service. Wow. My phone starts getting service through AT and T because now we're in an American colony, or it's what that was specific. American colony a week ago. Um, but uh, but yeah, money wise, um, there had been a good flow of rubles in and out because again, you have this huge eastern border. Um, Rostov, uh, I guess in English, what you say, Rostov. Um, is that what, Rostov? Rostov. Yeah, yeah. Rostov. Um, they, that's the biggest, the biggest city of entry. But then if you go all the way kind of up and down that eastern border, Varonezh isn't very far. It's like a big college town. Um, so there are lots of access points. Um, and there's a bus that has, you know, gone to and from Moscow to Donetsk, I think the whole way through. Um, so I, I think that's, that's how the humanitarian aid has been coming through the whole time. Now, what, what was interesting is that there was some presence, especially in the frontline cities of groups like Red Cross, um, up until the special operation. Um, this was another thing that, that we were told in a lot of these towns we would go into. Oh, yeah, they had a few Red Cross volunteers here. And then as soon as February hit, they all bounced. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, everybody was just gone. So, yeah, I mean, it's it, it's an interesting point that you raise because there's a gray area where the West is saying, well, well, this is Ukraine, you know, and Ukrainians are under attack and the Russians are stealing Ukrainian land. OK, if this is what you think, then are, you want to go help these people. Right. Because you're here to defend them. Right. I mean, it, 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 it's a very it's a very salient point. Like it's got to be one way or the other. You know, yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> because and if they don't want you here to help them, then what does that mean? You know, uh, uh, about this narrative of like, you know, these poor, oppressed Ukrainians. Um, so, yeah, that, that, that I mean, there's there's zero presence of, you know, any any Western institutions whatsoever. You know, I mean, even even on the media level, uh, you know, uh, there were a couple folks representing Western outlets there. Um, but, you know, I could count them on one hand. Uh you know, and I, I, as far as I know, I was certainly the only American left wing or, or American socialist, uh, you know, in, in any media grouping that, that, I, that I met there. Um, the Clarissa Ward wasn't, a, wasn't in a CNN's Clarissa Ward wasn't like with her big camera crew. No, in Don Pass. no, there was one guy from, for some reason, CNN Portugal uh, decided pretty consistently to air snippets of one of our comrades oh, okay. who, was, who was working there. He also worked for some, some other papers that were a little more, you know, kind of the red team. Um, but, uh, but Siena and Portugal would like occasionally air like the counterpoints so to this narrative. Okay. I so I guess maybe it's like being from Portugal. I don't know. They have like a different opinion of Europe, maybe than other, than well, other I mean, countries. I mean, it's might, a country right? with a very powerful communist party, yeah, um, okay. which means something. You know, yeah. and it's a country that's been fairly hit with the kind of, right. you know, Brussels uh, austerity and sort of financial colonization. So, you know, uh, maybe maybe that's some of it. Yeah. And then also like in the issue of sanctions then. So other than like the sort of um, other than the the. Because the reason I ask is because it was always interesting to me how, for example, in northern Syria, which is under like basically the former Al Qaeda groups control Mm -hmm. and then under Turkish control, sanctions don't apply. Right. 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 But then you go like a little bit further this way and it's like Syrian government territory and suddenly it's all under sanction. You can't, you know, interact or do any economic, you know, trade there. Um, and then if you go there, you are opening up yourself to possibly like getting in trouble. If you have the word Syria on, anything yep. related to like a GoFundMe or yep. like a Venmo or, you know, in the case, I mean, I actually did do a GoFundMe campaign back in like 2017, I think, to go do mm-hmm. a Syria trip. And I had to remove Syria in order for GoFundMe, like the word Syria. I'm going somewhere. <laughs> I'm going somewhere in the Middle East. I literally had to change it to like Middle East reporting trip so that I could uh, unfreeze the funds. Wow. But I'm just curious, like in the in terms of Donbass, like is going there considered like 
something that could potentially get you in trouble? Or is it like because of in terms of like sanctions, um, are people in Donbass under sanction? Um, if they're like considered allies of Russia, I don't even know if you're you're for like if you're familiar with that or not. But I'm just like curious how that plays out. Other than like the SIM card thing is interesting. That's so funny that like yeah, AT and T doesn't AT &T work in one up. place. And yeah. Everyone in, in, in the van is like, ah, Americans. <laughs> um, but uh, um, well, so at that point, I mean, again, things have changed diplomatically since I was there because when I was there, I was in the Donetsk People's Republic and the Lugansk People's Republic. According to the people who were there, according to the West, I was in Ukraine. According right. to Russia, I was in these separatist republics, which they had recognized pretty much at the outset of the special military out. Yeah. Um, when you cross the border into DPR, because um, that's where I crossed, was into the Donetsk Republic. Um, I went to Lugansk, but internally. Um, uh, they didn't stamp your passport. They gave you slips um, that sort of indicated that you were allowed to be there. Um, but but it wasn't going to show up as a stamp on your passport because yeah that, that that could have presented some kind of difficulty um, elsewhere. My understanding is that the the separatist regions fell under the same State Department kind of warning mm -hmm. that that was issued about like Russia's not safe for Americans right now. Um, where the sanctions start to come in are, is when you talk about a few different things. When you talk about uh, of course, material aid to anything that, that would be seen as like tied to the separatist governments or the Russian government. Um, mm -hmm. at, at the time, you could still give money to a 501c3 that was called like Donbass Mutual Aid. Um, even in like an Orthodox church that I went to back in New York, there was a, a, a collection for it. Um, I don't know if they've shut that down yet, um, but I know that like any other organizations, it was really sketchy trying to bring any money into. I also know that... Um, there was a list of companies, especially media organizations that were under sanction and that if you worked with them. Um, so this was like a concern when I came back. Um, I, I, I come from a very powerful media company here in the U.S., uh, my family's company. We, we, we don't have a great relationship, but I'm sort of tied to them in some legal ways. So when I got home, they appeared at my house. Um, concerned about a million things, wanting me to sign all sorts of liability waivers to separate them uh, from any association with this. And one of them was that there was this list of media outlets, um, in including like all the basic Russian networks that it said that if you worked with them, basically you violated sanctions laws that, you know, and could be prosecuted in the US. So the question was, what did work with mean? Yeah. Um, and they were concerned that it might be just granting an interview. Because um, of course, when you're like in a group of reporters and in the Donbass during the war and all of a sudden R Russia Channel One or whatever realizes that you're an American, they're kind of like, what, what the hell are you doing here? Can we talk to you? Um, yeah. So I, I, I gave that interview a few times, um, <laughs> kind of identical interview. And uh, and we were concerned that that could have been violating sanctions. No, it would have been if I actually did like a contra contracted job for them. Um, so that wasn't a thing. What was a thing um, and this popped up because at the, when I came back, my intent was was to go back in the summer. Um, and I basically got blocked from doing that. Um, the, the reason being that there was a so the initial sanctions order came out, you know, whenever it did February, March, um, which, you know, sort of shut down the West from Russia broadly. You know, right. The same way we sort of apply sanctions to everything. There was an additional order that took effect. Uh, in the summertime, I, I, I think it took effect in July and it was ordered before that in the spring that said uh, that anyone who uh, performs any financial services, uh, and I think later they added legal services, but in this order it was financial services for a U.S. citizen who is physically located in Russia or these separatist republics um, would also be violating sanctions law. So that means that if someone were to pay a tax bill on my behalf while I was in even Moscow, uh, they would have broken the law. That's so um, crazy. I think this is the, is this the order you're talking about? I think is it is. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. This is in May. So this was, this was issued by the department of treasury. I actually, you sent me this before and I read over it and I was like, this is like so confusing. Yep. Like you really have to be like an attorney and a, maybe an accountant to yeah. understand exactly what it means. But yeah, I mean, here's the title from the Department of Treasury. Prohibitions related to certain accounting, 
trust and corporate formation and management consulting services. Mm -hmm. And it says, I'm just going to read a little bit of it because I don't want people's eyes to glaze over too much. <laughs> but the director of Office of Foreign Assets Control, yada, 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 shall apply to the following categories of services, accounting, trust and corporate formation and management consulting. Um, as a result of the following activities are prohibited except to the extent provided by law or unless licensed or otherwise authorized. Like, what does this even mean? And then it goes on to say what's prohibited, which is the exportation, re-exportation, sale or supply directly or indirectly from the United States or by a United States person or <laughs> ever located of accounting, trust and corporate formation, uh, blah, 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 in the Russian Federation. I mean, it's almost, it looks like a trick. Mm -hmm. Like it's like trying to trick anybody who basically goes to Russia yeah. or associates in any way with Russia. But I guess this is what your attorneys, your accountants, whatever, were like concerned yeah, about. Yeah, well, I mean, it wasn't yeah. even my attorneys. And get, right? These are people who are representing my family's company, which is Cox mm -hmm. Enterprises, which is a massive media and automotive conglomeration. Um, and, and they were basically freaked out that, you know, whatever, the IRS or, or, or the State Department might come after them. Right. Um, Just because you went to Russia to right. then go report in the Donbass. Right. You know, I, do I suspect also that there are people in my family who have such an opposing view of the situation that like they wanted to sort of play hardball with this and mm -hmm. be like, don't let him go back there. Sure. Probably. Um, uh, but what was unique about this is, is because, I mean, the way that, would, that it was described to me and, and, and we did speak with like, uh, you know, attorneys independently that understand this kind of law, um, you know, it, it, it's even something as basic as like, oh, you know, I, I have four kids um, and I, you know, I have a good relationship with the the mother of my three older children who lives uh, in a different part of the country than I do. And if I happen to, she's like, she's from Russia, she's from St. Petersburg. Um, and our, and our children are dual citizens. Uh, if I were just in St. Petersburg and she had to pay a babysitter um, and somebody sent her a transfer of a hundred bucks on my behalf. That person has, has, has essentially committed treason by doing that, according to this is what they were saying. That's so for so me, crazy. being in a position where uh, outside of like whatever journalism work or kind of organizing work, Look, my opinion of myself is that my primary position in life is to extract as much of my family's hoarded wealth as possible uh, <laughs> and reappropriate it to revolutionary organizing. Class right? traitor is what you um, are. Well, it's just, I mean, it's just, this is how I've analyzed it, right? Yeah. Um, so to me, to, to go back over there and then be in a situation where like the dividends that would be coming out of my family's company would immediately be frozen or nobody could transfer them to me and I couldn't pay tax bills and I couldn't, you know, we have a, a land project that I helped start in Massachusetts. If I had a bill that came up to pay for any of the maintenance of that project, I wouldn't be able to do it. And if mm -hmm. anyone there did it for me, again, sanctions. So it, it took me returning off the board, um, off the table. Uh, wow, that's wild. That's yeah. really wild. Yeah. Especially because you're also like one of the like few people who's gone. Um, so it's also like preventing people from hearing what's happening in a certain place, at least yeah. in English language. Yeah. But that's, I mean, that's that's like another aspect of these. I mean, that's the economic, you know, warfare aspect of all this. I I do want to ask you about um, another issue, which is some, you know, tangentially related, and that is, you know, you when you were waiting to go to the Donbass, you spent some time in Moldova mm -hmm. waiting. Mm -hmm. um, and you talk about how the divide between there's there's a divide in Moldova between the pro Western and pro russian civilians there um and then but of course the moldovan government is led by somebody who's very close to the west a graduate of harvard university's jfk school of government uh who used to work for their world bank but anyways i mean it's like just a, and I'm, I'm quoting you here just as in ukraine there's a push in moldova by pro-west factions to limit public use of the russian language despite russia russian being the native tongue of hundreds of thousands of Moldovans. One man I speak to there who is the head of a Ukrainian diaspora NGO and a former candidate for vice mayor of a place I can't pronounce, the capital city. Happily in Russian and like Chisinau in Romanian. I don't, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, happily informs me that Ukrainians are European while Russians have Mongol blood. And I think that's really important because this is a very common sentiment in some of these countries 
or like in Central and of course Eastern Europe is this like divide. There's a lot of in places like Moldova, of course, there's a lot of Russian speakers and they're treated differently. There's like a real racism, mm -hmm. um, especially when you hear that whole it's a very Nazi like sentiment. The idea is that like Russian or ethnic Russian people have Mongol blood. Yeah. I'm sure curious if you could just elaborate a little bit on that divide. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. It reminded me too. Um, you know, this guy, he was he was the former um, Michael McFaul. He was the former yes. U.S. ambassador to Russia. He's like, it's like the worst Twitter ever, right? <laughs> like if you, if you just really want to like bash so yourself in the head over and over again, read his Twitter. But he tweeted something yesterday mm -hmm. uh, that sounded so much like that, basically saying something to the effect of like Putin had a chance to bring Russia into the fold of Western democracy, but he recreated Asian authoritarianism. Mm -hmm. You know, he uses this word like Asian authoritarianism. And it's just like, what? But like, like, like this is this is OK for a U.S. official to speak this way. Um, but look, I, I, I think. Hold the, on real quick. I just want to show the tweet so people like uh, see oh, yeah. what we're talking about. It's actually yeah, crazy. Asian autocratic power. Yeah. yeah after I'm going to for those who are just listening, Michael McFall, this is the former U.S. ambassador to Russia at one point. Right. He says after the collapse of the USSR, a democratic Russia had the chance to be a major respected European power. Putin, however, has pushed Russia in a different way, turning Russia yet again into a vassal of an Asian autocratic power. Such a wasted opportunity. Oh, well, this is basically like a more diplomatic way of calling Russians like uh, saying Russians are controlled by Mongols because right. this is I mean, this guy actually often this is one of the more tamer tweets. This guy but you know, like you're saying, the people in these places are basically like, like McFall, but in real life, McFall's right. Twitter stream, but in real well, life. And, and this has been Western policy in basically the former all all of the former Warsaw Pact, right? Like, um, if you follow this story, and and this is what I started to pick up on even more in Moldova, because um, I, I was basically in Moldova and Romania for an extended period trying to figure out how the hell I was going to get into Donbass. Mm -hmm. um, uh, because it, it was kind of the closest I could get, um, you know, without actually going in. Um, so what you start to see is that there has been this culture war that has gone on for 30 years now since the fall of the USSR. You know, and this is something I knew about to an extent, but but definitely not the depths of it and the exact nature of it. Um, I mentioned the beginning of that last article I wrote, um, a, a young Ukrainian communist that I met in Romania. Um who, who spoke to me a lot about kind of how things turned in Ukraine. Um, and it had a lot to do with, the, you know, this mass privatization, but it also had to do with what we say have seen in so many of these countries on the periphery, even as far as Georgia, where basically the West came in and uh, destroyed whatever industry existed in these places, right? All of these countries were deindustrialized. Mm -hmm. um, and what replaced whatever industry had pre-existed, generally speaking, has been the NGO circuit, um, which is dominated by the West. And, you know, early on in the 90s, kind of like low end staffers were hired by the these NGOs. And over the decades, they have risen into positions of bureaucratic prominence uh, in all of these countries. Um, and part and parcel with the sort of social engineering that's gone on with, with this kind of growth of NGOs um, uh, has been really fanning the flames of, of nationalist identities in all of these places. And, and, you know, and in some ways, this is this is a battle that 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 predates 1993, 1994. You know, it goes back to uh, the 40s and 30s and even the 20s when fascism is rising in Europe. Um, and and it, it really goes back to the Middle Ages when you're talking about like uh, religious wars be between, you know, the kingdoms in Poland and Lithuania, you know, and Catholicism and then Orthodoxy in the East. Um, and Ukraine was always kind of in the middle of that. Uh, but I think that the, the West identified very early on uh, that the best way for them to defeat multinational socialist states was balkanization. Mm -hmm. um, and, and how do you, I mean, I've seen these kind of like fantasies uh, that some of these liberals throw out there about Russia itself being balkanized into a million different yeah. countries. Um, but they succeeded in Yugoslavia. You know, uh, they bombed Belgrade to hell uh, in the process. They succeeded um, in Czechoslovakia. They succeeded. And in the other countries, which were their own republics, um, and, and in some cases, you know, completely different sovereign states from the USSR, uh, 
they were very successful in in stoking the rebirth of a, of strong national identities um, in places that in some cases didn't have them, right? Like mm -hmm. somewhere like Slovenia, the concept of Slovenia didn't really exist until the 20th century. Even <laughs> the concept of Croatia is like relatively novel, um, it, let alone Kosovo, you know, uh, uh, or places like this. So, you know, the same thing has sort of happened um, in Moldova, uh, where this kind of Moldovan nationalism has come to the forefront. And, and it's mostly just built about being anti-Russian. Um, and then you have these sort of Russian-identified Moldovans who are like, wait, what? Um, <laughs> And it depends. Are they trying to work for an NGO um, and get accepted into an Italian or American university? Uh, okay, if so, then they're probably doing everything they can to prove to everyone how much they hate Russia. Um, or uh, they're a normal working person, you know, that's trying to uh, retain the heritage that their family has had for generations. They might feel differently. I remember I went to a, a boxing shop the first week I was in Moldova. And they had, uh, I wear it all the time. They had a, a Russia team boxing shirt um, on like a rack in the back. It was like 50% off. And, you know, and I said to the guy there, I was like, oh, I guess these aren't that popular now. And he's like, oh, they're not that popular now. And then he looked right at me. He's like, but they will be again. Uh, <laughs> you know, like quiet. So this, this was bubbling the whole time. And then you had Transnistria uh, in the east, which is this um, totally separatist area of Moldova that like is not politically related to the Moldovan government at all. Mm -hmm. And then you have a couple of autonomous regions within Moldova, like Gagauzia, um, who have, have not like separated themselves completely economically and militarily the way that Transnistria has, but they have kind of legislative autonomy and they maintain economic ties to Moscow, sometimes like fuel deals, trade deals. Um, and they maintain this kind of Russian identity. Um, uh, so, so this goes on everywhere. Um, but the, look, the, the, the biggest undercurrent of, of all of this social engineering is, is anti-communism, anti-communism, anti-communism. Right. And so you right. have this generation of folks in their 20s and 30s who didn't live through any communism. Um, but they'll, they'll, you know, they'll be the first to tell you how horrible it was, um, uh, even though their, you know, their grandmother had a pension and now she doesn't. You know, uh, so that's a really, that's a goal. really... That's like Use one of the tactic you can. Well, that's like really interesting. You kind of describe this whole like NGO industrial complex that mm -hmm. that I, I think that's so interesting that that really pushes these ideas. Uh, and also it's a way to get a leg up. It's a way to get jobs in government. It's a way to get money because a lot of these economies um, it reminds me a lot of Lebanon. Like right now in Lebanon, the only uh, the only way to have a decent job is to work for like a Western funded NGO. And there's an entire ideology that goes along with that, that of course, like if your material reality is tied to it, you start to believe it, right? You start to like believe all these things that you have to say to move up and to move up and to move up and to like be able to like feed your family and house yourself and live a decently comfortable life and not like live in poverty. Um, and then on top of that, the whole idea of like the only way to balkanize these areas is to promote this sort of ultra nationalism that either didn't exist before or actually in many cases has its roots in World War II or pre-World War II, basically fascism, right. um, and is so dangerous in these parts of the world. And of course, nobody recognizes this. They're like, no, you know, you have to support Ukrainian nationalism. You need to support. And it's like, well, it has a really nasty history, actually. Uh, so maybe we shouldn't be supporting ultra-nationalism in places where like- well, Especially that kind of Ukrainian that nationalism. Kind, that kind, right. Okay. I'm not saying you can be a proud Ukrainian, see, but- Yeah. <laughs> but what we see very much is like, like Belarus and Ukraine, specifically those two places, um, were like regions of Russia. Yeah. You know, I, I mean, you, you could draw a parallel to the United States if you wanted to. I mean, the U United States is an illegal settler colony. Um, you know, and so the people of the U.S. don't really have generational roots. Right. So it's not a great analogy. But if you wanted to make it, you know, Ukrainian nationalism outside of the context of, of this kind of externally imposed Western fascism felt a lot more like, you know, welcome to the South. We have barbecue here. You know what I mean? <laughs> right. or, or, or like, you know, now you're in New England and we say pack the car and have a yad and you have, you know what I mean? Like, like, like we love the Red Sox. That sort of harmless, like pride in your ge geographic right, like locality. Pride. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. There were culture. like different kinds of like dress that they would wear in Ukraine and the borscht is slightly different. And, you know, but, but, but it was, but we're Russian. Everybody's Russian here. Yeah. Really. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. 
uh, and so that kind of that kind of nationalism existed, um, but but not this like not this ultra nationalism and, and not I mean of course we, we understand this from like uh, pretty much any any legacy of revolutionary theory that like nationalism can be revolutionary or it can be reactionary and it all has to do with whose material interests it is advancing. Yeah. And you know, what's also really interesting is the way, and this is more just commentary and feel free to add what you want to about this. Um, but the way that Ukrainians after, tw after last year were like so widely accepted into Europe. I don't know how long that will last, but right now it's like Ukrainians are pure. They're actually European oh, like us. Yeah, they're going to get pissed soon. But I actually remember, so I briefly lived in Germany back in like 2017. And obviously that was post 2014 where a lot of this neoliberalism that came along with the anti-Russian like pro nato government that the U.S. helped install in Ukraine. Uh, a lot of that neoliberalism really decayed the economy. And you had this you had this like huge, you know, wave of people leaving Ukraine to go find better work elsewhere. And a lot of those people ended up in Germany. I, I remember like a lot of the German restaurants, this just speaks to the sort of situation in the EU where Germany is kind of like the metropole imposing all these horrible policies on the periphery and the periphery here being, I mean, Ukraine's not a part of the EU, but you know, in terms of Italy, like I remember a lot of the but service. They signed an EU association agreement. Right. Yeah. yeah. Right. So like they yeah. are economically tied to it in many ways. And, but I remember like there was different groups of, of workers that were, that were people from certain countries specifically. So a lot of the service staff, a lot of the servers, the waitresses and waiters in restaurants in Berlin were Italians, like young Italians who'd graduated college and the Italian economy was not doing great. There wasn't that many jobs. So they all come to Germany looking for a brighter economic future. And then I remember a lot of like the uh, domestic service work, a lot of like the cleaning staff and these kinds of things were either Polish or Ukrainian. Mm -hmm. And it's so it was like you had a lot of these Ukrainians coming to basically work for Ukrainian wages, but mm -hmm. injure, but for rich people in Germany yep. or even middle class people in Germany. But I say, I just say that to say like, there's such a difference because back then Ukrainians were so looked down upon. Yep. And then now they occupy a very different space in the minds of Europeans, but I don't know how long that will last. I don't know if you have anything to add to that. Yeah, I mean, I think, look, we've already, especially in Poland, we've seen like, a lot of sort of pushback in, in the population, especially because, you know, look, there are historical rivalries between these yeah, two. Just um, a little bit. <laughs> but but Poland, look, Poland plays a huge role in all of this because Poland has aspirations to be the next Germany, mm -hmm. um, and a lot, which is why they're the most hawkish of kind of everybody in the room. And just, yeah, let's send fucking ground troops in now. Excuse me. Um, no, uh, <laughs> you know, um, but I, I think it was the minister of, oh, Lord, I, one of the something like the minister of finance or the treasury in Poland uh, recently, um, I was reading an article where he, he basically said, yeah, uh, the Polish economy has grown considerably in the last decade. Um, and we attribute a lot of that to the influx of uh, Ukrainian migrant workers, um, especially during Maidan, because what happened? The West came in. Austerity was imposed on Ukraine. Uh, all the public health care shut down. All the public universities shut down. Um, and the jobs shriveled up, you know, people are like, everyone in Ukraine is like invested in crypto, you know, like that's like, it's just like a hustle economy out there. Yeah. Um, so they came to Poland, um, and, and they worked cheap and, and this like really buttressed the Polish economy. Uh, so I think this was actually another one of the big motivations for all of this is, is now when this refugee crisis hit, there was a much bigger influx of cheap labor and they're way more down and out than they were in 2015 because in some cases you know some of these folks like really had to leave and didn't have the choice to go back it wasn't like well we've weighed our options and it seems like poland's a good choice it was like no we got to get the hell out yeah um, yeah uh and we saw this with like you know some uh, w what i considered to be uh, you know a pretty gross example was you know uh germany basically promoting like, oh, we'll take all the sex workers in, in from Ukraine and we'll, and we'll get you set up as a sex worker here. Um, you know, if you're not going to tell me that that's exploiting women, uh, you know, oh, you're, you're I mean, people coming from a war, war or like a neoliberal decayed war zone. Yeah. Right. Right. Like, I mean, it's, it's, it's really there was Ukrainian. There was actually Ukrainian sex workers in Lebanon before the Lebanon before Lebanon's economic collapse. There was Ukrainian. Yeah. It was pretty normal. That which well, was there were outside of like Southeast Asia, you know, you, you, Ukraine provides like probably more of the illegal sex trade than certainly any country in Europe. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that, 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 
that cheap labor is a big part of it. And, and, and again, this is like part of the tradition of how the capitalist West has exploited Eastern Europe forever. I yeah. mean, this is like part of why the revolution, like the first socialist revolution in human history happened in Russia. Um, uh, because of how Russia was used as basically a breeding ground for cheap labor and, and cheap soldiers, um, you know, and then they got in, wrapped up in the economics of the West and in World War One, and everything collapsed. Um, but they're just doing the same thing. Uh, yeah. Well, there's so I I know this is like a huge pivot, but I would be remiss not to ask you about uh, something that you've also been involved with, which is organizing against Cop City in Atlanta, which is something that we've been covering pretty regularly at Breakthrough News. Um, so before we wrap up here, I'm wondering if you've got anything to say about what's happening with Cop City. Yeah. Um, so, I, look, I lived in Atlanta from 2012 until 2018. Um, and during that time, uh, you know, that, that, that was the time of my life when, you know, my sort of like activism or radicalism went from theoretical to practical. Um, and that primarily came through anti-police organizing, mm -hmm. um, in a lot of different capacities. Uh, so once cop city started, I'd already left, but I, I know a lot of the people down there who were involved in it. Um, uh, you know, and my, my heart was very much with that movement. Um, and, uh, one of the reasons that, that I've sort of chosen to speak out a lot of, about it specifically is because my family is intimately involved with that project. Um, we're one of the larger corporations in Atlanta, um, and we've had sway over the Democratic Party in Georgia, uh, for 60, 70 years. Um, you know, there's, there's not a considerable Georgia Democrat that wasn't signed off on by the Cox family. Um, and again, full transparency, we, we are the wealthiest family in that state, uh, you know, by a long shot. And this is known by the people there. Um, uh, we have hosted a lot of the functions for the Atlanta Police Foundation, which is the entity that is pushing forward this project. Um, my cousin, my first cousin, who is the CEO of Cox, uh, holds an honorary chair, chairman position on the Atlanta P Police Foundation right now. Um, uh, and my father, uh, who is, of course, one of the owners of Cox, uh, is also one of the owners of the Atlanta Hawks, the NBA team and State Farm Arena, where they play. And this is another organization that has uh, contributed considerably to that. So, um, look, I, I, I've just tried to leverage a little bit of that position to shed light on the fact that, look, everywhere in the world, there is collusion amongst the ruling class to advance its own agenda. Um, and, and this collusion generally looks like th the political wing with the corporate wing with the law enforcement wing. Um, you know, and in some cases, military, when you're talking about foreign affairs, when you're speaking domestically, that means cops. Um, so I, I've tried to use my position to just kind of shine light on that complicity um, and saying, look, there's, there's an old saying in Atlanta that, that there's something called the Atlanta way, um, that things happen the Atlanta way. Uh, and, and basically what that means is backroom deals, right? Every policy that gets pushed forward in Atlanta gets pushed forward because, you know, you have a meeting essentially between members of the established black political class or the black bourgeoisie and the white corporate bourgeoisie. Um, and they decide, okay, let's make a deal. This is how it's going to go. And that's what happens. Um, and uh, there's a, a strong police force that, again, is very visibly black in Atlanta. Uh, that comes out to impose the will of the ruling class. And this is another instance of that, right? So we have 90 acres of, of forest that is considered one of the lungs of the city, which is supposed to be completely raised to build a police training facility five times anything the NYPD has access to. Um, immediately surrounded by all of the areas of the city which have been historically black and are being developed to hell right now. Um, so, you know, this is like, this is like Brat and Giuliani broken windows policy from the 90s on steroids, um, not to mention the ecological effects of destroying a forest in the middle of a city, which is known for being a very green city. Um, and, and so part of why, you know, I just try to speak out is because, look, my family's company has tried to promote itself as a green company. Um, you know, Cox Conserves is one of our big initiatives because, I don't know, we recycle water at some of our auto auctions or something. <laughs> um, but uh, 
But I really want, no, I, like I want to call these people out and, and say like, look, there are lots of corporations involved in this. Home Depot, Norfolk Southern. I mean, you could go on and on and on. Um, in this case, we are a privately owned family company. You cannot buy stock in Cox uh, on, on, the, on the open market. Um, so that means that there's look, maybe about a dozen of us who have some ownership stake, but really about five or six people who have full control over the entire company and two or three people that have a hell of a lot of sway in City Hall and, and with law enforcement in that city. Uh, their names are Alex Taylor, my first cousin, the CEO of Cox, Jim Kennedy, the chairman of the company who ran it for 30 years, and then their co-generational. Um, and, and those people have promoted themselves as environmentalists, uh, you know, and as people who care for the city of Atlanta. And, and I think it's important that people in Atlanta and, and around the country understand that, that these are the people who, who, who have the power to shift these decisions um, and that they are pushing forward initiatives that nobody ever voted on. And now it's gotten to the point where they're, they're, there's blood on everyone's hands in this equation um, because, of course, there, there was a, a, a young protester uh, Tortuguita yeah. is my poor pronunciation of their name, uh, who was, now we understand from the autopsy, shot sitting cross-legged 13 times with their hands raised in the air um, for, for sitting in a tree, uh, you know, and nothing else. And we have about two dozen people facing domestic terrorism charges for either doing the same thing or for attending a concert um, in the same place. And this is totally unprecedented. So... Uh, why is this happening? Because there's pressure from uh, the construction companies who have actually who have the bids to do the project, and because there's pressure from the corporate community, you know, to get this to stop, um, you know, to, to to put this resistance down, um, and so that it could set a precedent that would affect people all over the country in similar instances. You know, I could imagine I was at Standing Rock, for instance. Uh, when the whole fight over the pipeline was going down. Um, imagine if they had leveled domestic terrorism charges at every single Standing Rock protester that they pinched there. I mean, it would have totally changed the dynamics of that. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. You know, so 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 this is one of the scariest parts of it. You know, they're looking at like $300,000 of bail per person. Um, but again, you know, I like to talk about it because there's absolutely no chance that we would have ever seen a project like this develop if it wasn't about uh, the interests of a ruling class trying to dominate a community, um, right. you know, they, they don't want crime. Uh, they don't want to see black people. We don't want to see black people in the city the way we used to, um, uh, unless it's the right sort, you know, in their mind. And I'm just speaking from the mind of like uh, the white Southern bourgeoisie, especially the liberals, right? Um, a lot of these people are Democrats. Yeah. Um, that are part of putting this project together, white and black. Um, and it, it's, it, uh, yeah, it's, 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 just a, it's just an important point to raise again and again and again, because when we talk about these issues of uh, police violence, uh, police accountability of the community, we have to understand that there are not measures of reform that can be taken which will change the dynamics that if there is, if one class of people uh, has all the political power and dominates the relations of property in a given society, then law enforcement in that society is going to work for them. That's and it's key. going to advance their interests and it's going to do it violently. Then that's mm -hmm. the deal, right? So we need to put our focus on uh, disinheriting those people who run the show and recreating that system and building alternatives. Um, Ooh, dinner, dinner, family dinners at your house or your family's house must be so interesting <laughs> in terms of conversation or do they not happen anymore? I don't even they don't know. Happen. They don't happen. They don't happen. Well, Fergie, I could go on for a lot longer than an hour, but this was such a great conversation. Can you please tell people where they can find your work? Uh, so, uh, hopefully there'll be a new journal soon, but, uh, my <laughs> socials are all at JCC Fergie on uh, Instagram and Twitter, Telegram. And then uh, we're slowly trying to develop a, a sub stack for, uh, I have a small group called the Berkshire Communists in Western Mass. Um, and we have a sub stack that's combatliberalismma.substack.com named for Chairman Mao's great work. Uh, 
Uh, and so there, there's actually all of my articles from Donbass are there and, and, and it's all my work right now, but eventually that's going to be folks from our whole collective publishing articles and, and from elsewhere. So that's again, that's combat liberalism, ma.substack.com, or you can find, uh, our stuff at, at JCC Fergie or the Berkshire communists. Wonderful. Thank you so much for joining me for the hour to break all this down. I really appreciate it. Thanks so much. It was a great time. Thanks for watching everyone. If you want to see more progressive anti-imperialist content like this, make sure you hit the subscribe button so you can stay up to date with the latest breakthrough news content. And if you want to support our work and get access to exclusive content, head over to patreon.com slash breakthrough news.